Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, before we, we begin this morning, I, I uh, want you to know I am thankful to uh, be with you this morning and talk to you from uh, God's Word. Uh, as was already said, my name's Travis Walker. I'm one of the preachers uh, for the Lord's Church in Clovis, California. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to be here. I am, uh, like I said, when I first got on this morning, you know, preaching from my living room was a little bit different for me. So uh, I hope that you will uh, bear with me during this time. Uh, I hope and I pray that you are doing well. I know that uh, this situation that we find ourselves in is not necessarily the most ideal for what we would want. Uh, as Christians, our desire is to uh, worship the God with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And so being together uh, with brothers and sisters is always uh, preferable, but in these times, of course, we are not able to do that. So thank you again for having me. Thank you to the elders uh, for inviting me to speak uh, this morning. Uh, the lesson I have prepared is a lesson that I, I've delivered several times, and each time I deliver, it really takes on a different kind of dynamic, uh, because the situations that we find ourselves in are ones that uh, really start to, uh, you know, take the application of this lesson and uh, bring it to our, our own place. So why don't we start by, you know, we have our, uh, let's go ahead and advance the slide to the very first screen. See if it does. There we go. <clears throat> now you don't know me, and I don't know you. Uh, you don't know my life, and I don't know your life. You don't know my circumstances, and I don't know your circumstances. And I think it would be wrong to presume that we know those kinds of things. But there are some things about us as humans let alone Christians, that is universal. And part of that is the idea of stress. It is worry. It's anxiety. This last Thursday was uh, the fourth week anniversary, if we want to celebrate it or not, of uh, the governor of California, you know, putting a, a shelter in place, or what I would say, a shelter in peace uh, in, in place. And during this time, I think there's been a lot of feelings of anxiety, stress, worry, pressure. And even though because we are people of faith, we know that this time will come to an end, it does not necessarily uh, negate our present circumstances and, and our present feelings. But I want you to know that even after we get out of this, this situation, is our stress going to change? Are we at that point going to be able to throw up our arms and say, okay, life is now perfect. Life is now uh, wonderful. You know, it, it is that, that, you know, that, that bed of roses, if you would. No, we all know that stress is going to come back. Uh, anxiety is going to come back, pressure is going to come back, worry is going to come back. So let's advance the slide. I want us to note a few ways that we uh, deal with stress or a few areas where stress uh, comes to us. And what stress is really is it's struggling to cope with demands. Demands like those that are related to our finances. You know, money is one of those things that it, it, it's here one day and it's gone the next. You know, sometimes we worry about how do we put food on our table? You know, what's going to happen? How am I going to pay for medicine? How am I going to pay for a car repair? How am I going to pay for rent? I know here at Clovis, we have brethren that worry about those things. You know, they, they have medication that's related to their diabetes, and it costs an incredible amount of money or, or other kinds of, of medicines. People's cars break down. And so I don't know about you, but sometimes I do worry about those kinds of things. You know, where am uh, I'm going to find myself at the end of the month looking forward to the next month? And, and then there's demands that are related to our, our work. 
Now, while we're in shelter in place, maybe those demands are not as uh, prevalent, but there are demands that relate to work. And when we do go back to work, you know, we're going to talk about our work schedule, uh, our projects. Maybe we have feelings in, in our jobs that we are underappreciated, that our boss doesn't necessarily think that we are valuable. And those kinds of things build pressure in us. Or if we advance to the next point, you know, demands that are related to our school. Now, I have three kids. My, my three kids, uh, my youngest is uh, just getting ready to graduate high school uh, here in a, a month. And my other two are in college. And with the present situation, if you have kids that are in school, you understand this. And that is, there's a lot of work that they still have to do. And it makes it challenging, you know, if your kids come and ask you for, you know, advice on math homework now because they don't have their teacher necessarily present with them. It's tough. And so our kids have a lot of pressure. You know, maybe they're thinking about the next step in their life. Or if we advance again, we talk about demands relating to uh, our relationships. You know, things are, are great, you know, when we, when we start off in our relationships. But, you know, as time goes on and as we are at home longer and maybe around each other more, maybe you start to get some kind of pressure, maybe not getting along with the spouse as well as you could. Maybe you're not getting along with your kids right now because everyone's becoming stir crazy. Maybe you're newly married. Maybe you're about to be married. Maybe you've been married a long time. There's a lot of demands to life, aren't there? And that's just part of what we go through. But what this does is it creates an enormous amount of stress. Go ahead and advance once again to the next point. You know, it's been documented that there's been over the past 30 years, this is according to the Journal of Applied Psychology, over the past 30 years, there has been an increase in stress and anxiety between 10 and 30%. I mean, you know, that from, from 1990 to now, people in general just are more stressed, we're more anxious. Young adults spend more than, it says, six hours a day stressed out. The most you know, impacted group of those that have stress are the millennials, those being born in the 80s and the 90s. And we might ask questions, why is it that they're stressed out? Why is it we're all stressed out? But I don't know if that's absolutely necessary to try to diagnose, but this is what I want to say to you this morning. In whatever place you find yourself right now, in whatever your life situation is, in whatever pain you feel, I don't know what it is, and you don't know what mine are. But the thing that we need to remember as brothers and sisters in Christ is that peace is possible. Peace is always possible. And that brings us to our, our text that was read this morning in Matthew chapter 14 and in verse 22 through 33. If, if you remember, it, it's the scene where Jesus walks on the water. And it is uh, told again in Mark's gospel as well as in John's gospel. But if you look at your, if you have your Bible and you're looking at that text, I want you to kind of scan to the the paragraph that just precedes Jesus walking on the water. And what you'll notice in Matthew chapter 14 and in verse 13 is the heading, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Now, this is one of the most tremendous miracles that Jesus did. If we could rate them, I don't know if you can re rate uh, the, the supernatural, but this one is definitely one of the most remarkable for this reason. In all of the Gospels, in all four of the Gospels, there are only two miracles, two specific miracles, that are told in every Gospel account. 
in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Now, obviously, the, the very first one is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, he's declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. There's a good reason why the resurrection is in every gospel. That is the, the message that the apostles were commissioned to go out and to say, Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8, that you will be my witnesses. And so they went out and said, we've seen the resurrected Lord. Even Saul of Tarsus saw Jesus on the road, enabling him to be an apostle. The second miracle that is in every gospel account is feeding the 5,000. Now, there's, there's other types of miracles that are found in every account, namely Jesus healing blind. You can find that in every gospel. But a specific example of what Jesus did, a specific situation, is feeding the 5,000. I want you to think about that day. When Jesus fed the 5,000, remember the, the story, the situation. You know, there's a large crowd that is gathering around Jesus. And in John's account, it says Jesus looks up and he sees that a large crowd was coming towards him. And it is this setting that he does this wonderful miracle, a miracle really that is more than 5,000. It was 5,000 men. So it could be anywhere upwards of 10 to 12,000 people. And you remember what the miracle was. Jesus took five loaves, two fish. He blessed them and he multiplied and he fed the multitude of anywhere between 10 to 12,000 people, and they had leftovers after everyone was full that, that filled 12 baskets. This day was a day of, of four things I want you to think about. First of all, it was a day of affirmation. Jesus was affirming something in this miracle. In John 6 and verse 6, you know, Jesus says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now, Philip was an apostle, and Philip would know that Jesus had the ability to do works. But Jesus asked this question, and what's remarkable is Philip's answer. Even though Jesus knew what he was going to do, Philip did not understand. And he, he says, Lord, you know, if we have so much money, 200 denarii, he says, that's not going to be enough to give everyone just a little bit. And that's all we have. And so what Jesus is doing, and one is he's teaching Philip a lesson here, and that is, Philip, I'm with you, and I can do these works. But it's also a day of reaffirmation. Now think about this. Andrew, in John chapter 6, and verse 8 and verse 9, Andrew, one of his disciples, says to him, he says, there's a boy that has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? And we might look at the end of that verse and say, well, Andrew, you doubt just like Philip doubted. What, what are they for so many? We can't do this. But have you ever thought about this? For some reason, Andrew, looking at this boy that only has five loaves and two fish, Andrew says, you know what? I, I'm not sure what Jesus can do, but maybe he can do something. Because most of us would probably think, you well, know, you know, we would look at the boy and say, that's just five loaves, two fish. That's nothing. Why even bother the master? Andrew has some faith. And so what Jesus is doing is he's going to reaffirm something to Andrew. It's a day of proclamation in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. Jesus did many other signs, but these are written so that you may believe. And if you look at John's gospel, there are seven miracles that are presented. One of those is the feeding of the 5,000. What John was saying in verse 30 and 31 of chapter 20 is, Jesus did a lot of signs, but these seven are so extraordinary that they will change your life. So John records the miracle of feeding the 5,000. Jesus is proclaimed to be the Son of God that we might have life in his name. And then it was also a day of celebration. And this gets us back into Matthew 14 in our text. Because after the, the disciples collect the, the 12 baskets of remnants, excuse me, um, after the disciples collected the, the 12 baskets of remnants, what's Jesus do? It says in verse 22 of Matthew 14, immediately 
he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now think about it. If you were one of the disciples, if you were one of the 12 followers of Jesus, and you just witnessed this miraculous event, how would you feel? Would you possibly feel, hey, we're we're following Jesus. This is our our master. This is our rabbi. This is the one we believe to be the Son of God. We believe in him. Look what he just did. We're following the right guy. And you could see them almost celebrating the events of the day. But then they start to cross the sea. And when they start crossing the sea, I would propose proposed that the sea was perfectly calm. It wouldn't make sense to get into a boat across the sea that was already stormy. Peter, Andrew, James, and John being fishermen on the Sea of Galilee would know that that wasn't, uh, you know, the right thing to do. And so what do they do? They cross a, a tranquil sea, and Jesus goes up on the mountain, and he starts praying. But what happens? A strong wind starts to blow, while the disciples are a long way from land, they're beaten by the waves, making little progress into no progress, and they're faced with an incredible challenge. And here's the point. In those turbulent circumstances, for the disciples, when their lives seemed out of control, that's when they learned this lesson, that in the most difficult times, with Jesus, peace is possible. Peace is possible for us in, in our lives. And let me give you a few reasons from this text of why peace is possible. It's possible when I understand, first of all, that God's plan grows my life. Go ahead and advance the slide one. When God's plan grows my life. Now, I want you to think uh, about this. Jesus obviously is the master of the winds and the waves. Would you agree? He, he's calmed storms uh, when he was in the boat with the disciples and asleep. He was able to have peace and, and, and feelings of safety because he was the Lord. He was the master and those things were not going to affect the boat while he was on them. And so if Jesus, the master of the wind and the waves, can walk on water as he's going to do in this text, don't you think he can forecast the weather? That Jesus can know exactly what the weather is going to be? I mean, Jesus would be a, a weatherman with a, a, a success percentage of 100%, contrary to what we have in our, our TVs and on the news today. So what I would say is that this storm was not necessarily accidental. Because why would Jesus put the disciples in the boat to put them in the situation and, and he, he's caught off guard? No, that doesn't make sense to me. See, sometimes the storms that we face, the, the troubles, the struggles, the difficulties, the challenges, sometimes those are allowed by God. And, and, and so I would say that some of our storms are providential. They're purposeful. And why is that? Well, you go back to the book of Job, and you can see in Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, God allowing storms to come into Job's life. And ultimately, uh, the, the reason was to demonstrate something to the heavenly places. And you see that in the discussion between God and Satan, chapter 1, chapter 2. But it was also to teach Job a lesson. Because at the end of the book, Job says that, you know, I have heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. Job's belief in God changed. His faith changed. The dynamic of that changed. He drew closer to God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and at verse 5, it talks about not despising the chastening of the Lord, knowing that the Lord chastens who? Those whom he loves. There's something that God does through these storms. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he talks to the children of Israel as they're getting ready to enter in the land of Canaan. And he tells them, he says, I withheld food and I withheld all these things. And I made you wander so that when you get into a land that has plenty, you will still trust in me. 
And you know, there are times where God allows peaceful sail sailing on the sea of life. And you might be there right now. And if you are, I think we need to be thankful for that. Because those times are there so we can continue to draw close to God. So let me ask a question. What's God's desire for you? What does he want for you? In Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, it says, Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What does God want for you? What does he want for me? He wants me each and every day to be more like Jesus. And he uses his word, the circumstances in our lives, to be able to help us on that journey or in that process. The psalmist in Psalm 4 and a verse 1 in the King James Version, he says, you have enlarged me when I was in distress. Now, I, I believe it's safe to say that if you had your choice between positive times of joy, where everything was peaceful and there's no issues in your life, and on the other hand, you had the times of pain and a heartache, which one would you rather have? I mean, we would all say, wouldn't we? I would rather have those good times. But the truth is that it's in those times of pain and heartache that we learn some of the greatest lessons. We learn peace is possible. And that peace is possible when we understand that God's doing something. He's trying to grow me. That's what he wanted to do with Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9, when Paul had the thorn in the flesh. Remember, Paul said three times, Lord, we're please remove this. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm teaching you something, Paul. I'm helping you to learn. And when God told Paul, my, my grace is sufficient for you, and God told Paul the purpose, Paul was at peace. And that's when we're at peace as well. Well, maybe we think, you know, when we look at our lives and struggles that, yeah, okay, I can have peace that God's working something in my life, but I just can't handle these situations. And the truth is, you're absolutely right. Apart from God, we are powerless and impotent to handle the situations in our lives. And so what do we need? We need to understand, number two, God's prayers grace my life. We need to understand God's prayers grace our lives. Where was Jesus when the disciples are on the boat in the middle of the sea? Where was Jesus? He was praying, wasn't he? He's on the hill and he's praying to God. But there's something that Mark's gospel says that the other gospels do not. Mark 6 and verse 48. It says, and he saw, that is, Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully. Jesus saw that his disciples were struggling. Don't ever think that Jesus has forsaken you. Don't ever think Jesus can't see you. Because even though we can't see Jesus physically, we can have faith that Jesus is on the mountain and he's aware of you. He's aware of you right now in your circumstances. He's, he's aware of you right now in your challenges. He's aware of you right now in your difficulties. I like the old hymn, Does Jesus Care? Does Jesus care when there's pain in our lives. Does he care about the struggles of our faith that we all have? And the answer in that hymn is, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. See, Jesus is on the mountain, and he's doing two things. He sees the disciples and their struggles, but secondly, he's also praying. Jesus is making intercession for you and me in our struggles. He's making intercession to God the Father on our behalf, just like the Holy Spirit is in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, where he helps us in our weaknesses. 
I want you to think about if Jesus cares about my life and Jesus cares about my struggles and Jesus intercedes on my behalf. Isn't peace possible? Isn't peace possible? The third thing is that God's presence gladdens my life. Look at verse 27. Matthew 14, verse 27. Immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. I want you to get the picture. The disciples are in a boat that fits 12 of them and 12 baskets, those 12 remnants of feeding the 5,000. It's a boat that was a pretty decent size for the disciples to be in. And, and here they are, they go across the sea and it starts out and it's peaceful. It, it is calm. And the storm comes out. And the disciples are struggling. All 12 of them are working hard so as to not sink. And then Jesus comes to them on the water. Verse 26, when the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. You ever wonder why Jesus didn't go out sooner? It's been several hours of the disciples on the sea in this storm. It's the middle of the night when this happens. Why didn't Jesus go out earlier? Why did he wait? Had he forgotten them? Had he uh, you know, gotten to a point where he wasn't concerned about them? May I suggest his delay was deliberate? In John chapter 11, when Jesus received word that Lazarus was sick, what did Jesus do? He waited two days to travel two more days. And then when he gets there, both Mary and Martha say, Lord, if you had been here sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. Why did Jesus wait? Because it didn't make sense to Mary, and it didn't make sense to Martha, and it didn't make sense to the disciples. Why did he wait? He waited to glorify himself, didn't he? He tells it to his disciples in the beginning of that context. Or in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, after sin enters into the world. Why is it that God at that point in time did not send Jesus? Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 it says, In the fullness of times, God sent forth his son. There was something about that time that was not conducive to the will of God. What was it? God was going to glorify himself. And so, why might ask the question, you know, why is it Jesus waited to go out on the sea? I would suggest it was ultimately to glorify himself, to demonstrate who he is as the son of God. So he goes out there and he says, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. If we were to put it in today's vernacular, it's I'm here for you. It's okay. You can do this. How would your life change if Jesus was physically right beside you? When you face the day, you get up in the morning, you face the challenges of the day. How would that change if Jesus was right there. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, and at verse five, the apostle Paul, while in prison for his faith and the proclamation of the gospel, he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, I think sometimes we can look at the phrase, the Lord is at hand. And we can think, oh, that's second coming kind of language. That's judgment language. I would suggest that this is not second coming language. Rather, what Paul is saying is Jesus is close to you. Sure, Jesus isn't with us physically, 
but Jesus is with us spiritually. Now think, if you know that Jesus sees you and Jesus is with you every moment of every day, in every struggle, every challenge, is peace possible? It changes the dynamic of our life, knowing that Jesus is with me every step I take. Well, let me give you number four from our text. And that is God's power guards my life. Matthew 14 and verse 28. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? I have uh, up here on uh, the wall in, in my family room, I, I have this, oh, this piece of art, this, and it has a saying in it. And the, the saying is that, is to say the will of God will never take you where the grace of God cannot protect you. So Peter is here, and Peter sees Jesus, and, and he says, if. Now, there's two ways the word if is used in Greek. One is a statement of condition. That's kind of how we use it. And the other is a statement of affirmation, and that is since. I don't think Peter is saying, if you're Jesus or not. Once he knew it was Jesus, then he's saying, since it's you, because it's you, my Lord, my master, the miracle worker, because it is you, command me to come on the water. And Jesus said, come. Now, Peter kind of some, kind of at times gets a bad rap. It's kind of due, though, because he messes up quite often. But you ever think about Peter getting out of that boat and leaving 11 others in the boat? Oh, yeah, oh, Peter, he's going to sink. That is a lack of faith. Yes, but Peter got out. You imagine sitting on the side of that boat with your feet dangling over, just hovering above the water. And then taking a step down. What do you think of that situation? Okay, I'm going to put my foot on the water. And I'm going to see if it goes down, if it's going to sink. No. Peter puts his foot on the water and is firmly planted, just as if we were walking on a solid surface today. And then he puts the other foot on the water. And miraculously, Peter walks. What a tremendous amount of faith. And he's going to Jesus. But then Peter looks at what's all around him. And he looks at the scenario of the wind and the waves, and it starts to hit him. Fear takes a hold of Peter, and Peter starts to sink. And he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Do you know what the next verse says in verse 31? Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. How far apart were Jesus and Peter? If we were in an auditorium and I was doing this, I'd stand up and show the situation. But think about that. Peter is sinking, and he cries out, Jesus, save me. And immediately, Jesus reaches out his arm, his hand, and he takes hold of Peter. And the point is that even when we're close to Jesus, there's times where our faith might struggle. And we cry out to the Lord, and he is right there. And he gives me an escape. He gives me what I need, the strength to be able to survive. Now, if I know God gives me that escape, and he forgives my feelings. Can we say that peace is possible? And the last thing I want us to note is in verse 32. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. God's purpose guides 
my life. Matthew's account says they worshiped him. John's account, if you go over to John chapter 6 and verse 21, what it says is that immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Here's my point. When we follow Jesus and we submit to his will, we submit to his purpose, at some point, we're going to find ourselves at the land to which we're going. He is the captain of our faith. And he will land us on the shores of eternity, our aim and our hope. Knowing that his purpose for my life is not to have physical life here, but to have eternal life without the cares, without the pains, without the struggles, without the challenges. You know what I say? Peace is possible. Peace is possible when we know that God wants to grow my life. When Jesus intercedes for me, God prays for my life. That God is with me and that gladdens my life and that God has power and that guards my life, and God has a purpose that guides my life, and all of those coupled together gives me peace in life. Peace each and every day, where we can, can say confidently, I serve God. I hope that heaven is your home, your own hope, and where you want to go. You know, Jesus is the only way to that eternal shore. And with him in your life, you'll be able to get there. This is a point in time where typically we would have a, an invitation, but I would just suggest to you, you know, if you have a spiritual need at all, contact the elders of the congregation there and communicate that need. If you're overwhelmed with the things that are going on in your own life right now, contact them, have them pray with you and for you. If you need to make a, a change in your life, then make that change. If you need to obey the gospel, then call one of the, the, the members of the congregation there and, and say, I, I need to respond to the gospel. Whatever your need is, take care of that need today. Take care of that need. I thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you uh, about some things from God's word. And maybe, uh, Lord willing, when all of this is done and over with, that uh, uh, we'll be able to meet in person. And whether we are able to meet in person or not, we do know that when this life is over, we have a home that's promised. And that promise is guaranteed by our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening.